Well, this is Michael Bretti. <laughs> He's currently leading the first and possibly only open source electric propulsion program out there, providing complete and extensive resources to the community to lower the barrier of entry and cost for enthusiasts in the field and engaging the community to provide details and awareness about electric propulsion in general, showing how it can be done with limited resources from home. This talk is called Open Source Micropropulsion Development for Small Satellites. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so yesterday we were, I talked about some more theoretical design stuff, so today we're going to see some actually tangible uh, stuff. So I'm going to go through the um, evolution of one of the plasma, the first um, propulsion series that I'm working on, the GPPT series uh, for small satellites. So again, um, in an overview, as far as I'm aware, I'm really the only one out there doing this, um, both open source and at home. Um, providing you know full and complete details for all these systems, so CAD electronics specifications, full build walkthroughs. You can um, actually see galleries of how all the steps involved with the system. Um, really, my goal is to reduce the barrier of entry um, for propulsion because it's uh, extraordinarily expensive, and uh, there's while there's a lot of work done for CubeSat propulsion, um, it's still not quite at the level where everybody can access it. Um, so my goal is really to make ultra low cost, very simple to make, uh, fully deployed, fully deployable electric propulsion modules, uh, really for enthusiasts, for startups, uh, for academic research. Um, so yeah, so this is the very first prototype of the GPPT series. So uh, stands for gridded pulse plasma thruster. Um, so extraordinarily simple design, pretty much just alternating. Um, copper and Teflon plates. Uh, this is a highly unusual geometry for pulse plasma thrusters um, because really all my development has been uh, for pocket cubes. Um, so I'm taking propulsion to really another level of scaling, um, which really hasn't been done um, just because for a pocket cube you have so much power um, and space constraints, even more than a CubeSat. It's, it's an extraordinary challenge. So a little bit of an overview, it's, it's a flat stacked plate geometry, um, pretty small in size. Um, I use multiple channels to extend the lifetime of, of the fuel based on just the size constraints um, using common materials, copper plate, Teflon plate, um, some peak hardware to hold it together. Uh, this first one was, I was looking at kind of the low energy range of operations, so less than five joules of energy um, operating in electrothermal mode for PPT. Um, so from top to bottom, you have the anode plate, the fuel plate, uh, the cathode, an insulator, and the igniter. Um, so this is actually the thruster firing uh, in my high vacuum chamber. Uh, I always start testing at one times 10 to the minus five tor. Um, this thruster only lasted four pulses due to the igniter spacing was way too large. Um, and actually to get this picture, I ended up destroying about 90% of my electronics because um, of arcs and pushing it way harder than it should have been. Um, so I went on to the GPPT 2-1C, so single channel gridded pulse plasma thruster. So scaling it down, making it much smaller and simpler. Um, still, this is a slightly modified configuration. Um, so still flat stacked geometry, uh, very small in size, 19 by 19 by 16 millimeters. Um, I modified the ignition configuration. So you can see here that um, first off, uh, the igniter and the cathode are reversed. So the igniter is actually the center uh, plate uh, here, and the cathode is this um, pin plate. So it's very unusual um, because normally pulse plasma thrusters use um, uh, an igniter pin um, with a standard, you know, spark plug type thing for aviation. Uh, so um, it's very unusual um, in this regard, and this also makes it easier for integration for electronics, which I'll get to later. Uh, so this is the components. I literally did these by hand with hand tools, so Dremel, drill, um, stuff on the table. Uh, so extraordinarily simple. Anyone can really do this. Um, and it costs literally nothing in parts. Um, so this is the thruster firing at uh, a couple of different rates. So I have a 0.84 joule uh, firing energy at 1 hertz and then uh, 0.23 joules at 2 hertz. Um, you can actually kind of see that the Teflon illuminating a little bit. Uh, from the plasma when it fires. So it's great and all to fire the thrusters, but it's useless if you can't take measurements on them. Um, so I built a very simple um, thrust stand for actually taking measurements. So this is a, is a micro pendulum that uses a very fine wire and a Kapton flapper. And you can see kind of how it's aligned in the chamber. 
Um, and by knowing the properties of the pendulum, so like the length, the mass, and then looking at the deflection of the pendulum, you can very easily calculate the force generated on the pendulum. So on the left picture, you can actually see the plasma firing and interacting with the Kapton flapper. And on the right side, you kind of can see the, the angle of displacement. Uh, so um, a little bit of, of data was collected for this run. So uh, you can see uh, uh, several different energies that were tested. This is average um, looking at impulse bit in micronewton seconds. Uh, versus the energy. Um, so one thing that you actually see here is a nonlinear trend, uh, which is very typical for, for electrothermal mode pulse plasma thrusters. Uh, the larger electromagnetic pulse plasma thrusters are, are very linear in scaling. So this makes this style uh, much more difficult to optimize. Um, so this is the current iteration of my thruster. These ones were actually properly machined uh, externally. Uh, the GPPT-3 series. So here we can actually see a few different fuels now. Um, the leftmost one is Teflon, which is by far the most default fuel for pulse plasma thrusters. But I'll also be exploring other fuels such as Ultem and Peak to see kind of how that affects lifetime and performance and other characteristics of the thruster. Um, so this one is actually very different. Uh, still flat stack plate geometry, uh, very small in size. It's now being optimized for extraordinarily low energies, so less than a quarter of a joule, which is at the you know, absolute lowest end of, electro, of uh, pulse plasma thrusters. Um, the fuel bore has been reduced and lengthened to increase the amount of fuel in the, um, amount in, in the small size and um, really allows it to operate better at, at lower energies for ignition. Um, a unique feature about this thruster is that I have an embedded N52 permanent magnet um, in the anode plate to create a, a, a magnetic nozzle um, which acts on the electrothermal portion of acceleration for the plasma. Um, so I'm also be exploring uh, new fuels, um, tapped anode plate so you don't need nuts or anything to hold it together like the previous ones. And this is the first one that actually has direct integration with the electronics module. So before I was running this thing with high voltage supplies, big uh, clunky things and huge glass, glass tube pulsers and everything. Um, so this is actually kind of the first step towards a usable system. Um, so you can actually see here kind of the, the different components and how it's, uh, you know, the pre-assembly of the different thrusters and everything with the magnetic uh, nozzle piece inserted. So this is now a complete uh, propulsion module. I actually have this here so you can, uh, pa I can pass it around when it's done. So a very, very small, uh, low power thruster. Um, so some features about it, the entire package is 40 by 38 by 24 millimeters. So again, this is made to directly integrate with pocket cubes. 3.3 um, nominal operating voltage, uh, less than 550 milliwatts peak power. Uh, the impulse bit I've measured so far um, at 3.3 volts is 0.65 micronewton seconds which at a nominal repetition rate of about a third of a hertz equates to about 0.22 micronewtons of thrust. Uh, the total mass is 34 grams. Uh, currently, I've tested it up to 2,000 shot, 2,100 shots to date. Um, the theoretical amount of fuel, at least assuming one um, microgram uh, or less per shot would be at least 100,000 or more. Um, so I've got quite a long ways to go. Um, and it's very plug and play, so you just need uh, the plus and minus voltages, enable, and a trigger command. All, again, fully compatible with pocket cube voltages um, and just standard supplies. And this model actually includes uh, primary and ignition bank uh, voltage readouts as well. So this is the circuit of it. Um, it's an extraordinarily simple circuit. You have uh, the bottom here, a, a load switch to enable and disable the power supply, a small MCO supply, which actually does have flight heritage. Um, and then really all it's doing is just charging a couple of capacitor banks through the high voltage bus. Uh, the ignition is triggered through a thyristor, which uh, pulses the ignition bank capacitor through a small pulse transformer to create the ignition spark between the cathode and the anode, which ablates the, the Teflon fuel, which temporarily raises the pressure inside the chamber to cause the main discharge between the main bank, which is the anode, and then the cathode piece to occur. Um, so this is the current thruster actually firing in vacuum. Uh, something that's really interesting is that all of these use 
um, Teflon, and each time the, the plasma color has been different. I've gone from purple to blue to pink now, uh, so anyone who knows plasma physics might uh, be able to help me out with why that's occurring. But this is the, the full module. Um, this is currently controlled with an Arduino Uno um, outside of the um, chamber, so powered 3.3 volts with a simple um, trigger command from the Arduino. So kind of going forward, um, I actually am delivering two of these thrusters to FASA systems in Spain um, for joint collaboration. Uh, so this would be a, a, a fully open source advanced mission for satellite and thruster testing at the pocket cube level. And if it's successful, uh, it would be the, the first pocket cube to ever fire propulsion in orbit, uh, which would be probably a pretty, pretty historic uh, flight for, for this level of, of um, satellites, and it would really be the first fully open source, independent, home-built uh, thruster to actually fire in orbit. So uh, it would be very exciting if, if everything goes to plan. Um, then going forward, continuing to optimize and characterize the, the current GPPT series. Um, I'm all, the, the model that I have right now is version 3. Uh, version 4 is going to look to increase the repetition rate um, and increase lifetime and look at the new fuels. Uh, the main um, bottleneck for performance right now is the main pulse capacitor. It's under uh, extraordinary um, stresses during the pulse. Uh, essentially, it's just charging into almost a short load into the plasma. So, you know, upwards of you know, several hundred amps uh, during the pulse into the plasma, which puts a lot of stresses, and that's the part that actually currently fails. Um, right now, after 2,000 shots, there's been no sign of wear or even util utilization of the fuel yet. Um, and then really to make this, make this thruster available uh, for hobbyists, for startups, for academic labs. So really, you know, if you work at a propulsion lab or you're doing your research at a propulsion lab or something, you know, you can either make it yourself or you know, I, can, I can make it for you and, and you know, sell it to you. And um, it's really plug and play again, 3.3 3 volts, very low power constraints. And, it's made in a way that you can make changes and modify it pretty easily. With the fuels, you can try a whole bunch of different fuels because the plate is an extraordinarily simple geometry, so it allows a lot of customization and um, ability to, to experiment. And then I also um, will be tackling other types of propulsion, uh, electric propulsion. Uh, if it's out there, I'm going to end up um, trying it. It's only a matter of time, and I guess at this point a little bit of funding because right now it's all out of pocket. Um, but I will be exploring things like colloidal electrospray, which again, like I mentioned yesterday, uses uh, room temperature molten salts. Uh, FEEP, which it uses uh, liquid metals, uh, RF plasma, and really scaling up now. Um, I started with pocket cubes because it's an extraordinary and unique challenge because it's, there's just nothing out there really in the literature or that's really been done yet. And in electric propulsion, it's much easier to go up than down. Um, so I started with really the, the hardest problem of going as small as possible. Um, and quite honestly, with a CubeSat, it's much easier to do propulsion over a pocket cube because you have so much more space and so much more power available. Um, so there's less constraints in that regard. And power for electric propulsion is the number one constraint. Um, so these are the two flight modules that I'll be actually sending out when I return from the conference to uh, FOSSA Systems. Um, so that'll be very exciting. They'll go through the full vibration and thermal testing and then integration, and then hopefully they'll launch early next year. And then here's kind of a conceptual CAD model of liquid metal FEEP um, that I'll be designing. So again, this will be made with uh, common materials. I'm actually looking at, um, instead of special welded stainless or titanium chambers, I'm actually using machined plastic uh, for, for the body, which has some advantages. Um, and using common components, and actually looking at uh, utilizing gallon stand uh, metal. So normally FEEP uses metals that require some heaters, um, such as gallium or indium, uh, which draw power, but gallon stand can actually um, stay liquid at you know, like minus 10, minus 20 C. Um, so that relaxes some power, power requirements and really hasn't been done as far as I'm aware for this type of thruster. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening, and you know, if anyone here is interested in electric propulsion for their CubeSats, uh, that's kind of why I'm here, so thank you.
So thank you for the presentation. Uh, just a question. Uh, have you ever uh, measured the electromagnetic interference that uh, maybe you can have doing pulses, high voltage pulses near uh, like other subsystems of the... Well, that, that'll right. be one of the, the big things that'll be tested during integration is they're gonna actually stick it in their uh, system and just see what happens. Um, there is some interference when I do with the Arduino, so I do have to put some maybe chokes on the line um, for now because the pulse is so high, but probably going forward, I'll have to reduce the, the pulse energy to increase the capacitor lifetime. So there'll be trade-offs, but um, we'll see very soon how it actually plays along with other su subsystems. Uh, great presentation, Michael. Um, uh, I was wondering, so is there any, you, you mentioned peak and we're seeing, um, or I'm seeing, there's like quite a lot of cheap recipes for high temperature 3D printers capable of doing peak, starting yeah. to kind of get down to affordable levels. Do you think there's any advantage in, uh, in that approach in terms of like geometry and, and uh, you know, uh, to I, I have actually considered um, the, the high, high temperature printing for Ultim and, and, and peak. I think it could be very interesting uh, if you have access to it. Um, at least from what I've found, uh, these materials, even though they're very um, high, they're, they're, they're normally high cost, but at this size, I've been able to get, you know, sheets of it for like tw 20 bucks online that would last, you know, five, 10 thrusters. Um, so the, the small size actually plays very well. Um, but again, if you want to do some sort of customization with the, the, fu the fuel size or multiple channels, um, 3D printing would actually be a very interesting way going forward. Similar question like before, um, for this mechanical design, what's, what did you use for that? Uh, for which? Mechanical design for the... Oh, uh, so I use uh, Fusion 360. Um, so it's, it's very convenient and um, all the CAD files for this are released, the schematics and bill of materials I did release and everything. Um, but for the CAD, yeah, it's a Fusion 360. And the other thing is, uh, FOSA systems, how did you, uh, how was this contact established? How um, well, I, I was kind of, uh, actually, actually Joe uh, was the guy who really got me uh, in, introduced to the whole open source, open, open space community before I was kind of just doing this on my own. Um, and then he approached me and was like, hey, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole open space community and no one's doing this stuff yet. So it really actually, I went from just going to maybe playing around with thrusters and vacuum to actually having a goal now to actually producing ones for the community and really pushing it forward um, so everyone can access it. So I, I really have to thank Joe actually for, uh, for getting me involved. But then, you know, talking with the Pocket Cube community in those chats, um, Julian, uh, who's the CEO of FOSSA Systems, actually just approached me and he was like, hey, uh, we, we want to try this out. So uh, it's been amazing to work with him and uh, really excited to see how far he pushes his system. Uh, what's export compliance like? Uh, so I've actually looked at this. I was a little bit worried. Um, um, there, there is ITER and there is EAR. Um, and at this level, um, First of all, you have to look kind of at the whole thruster as a, as a full system, and then you have to look at the individual components. Right now, the thruster, um, for thruster control for, for, for ITER and EAR, um, they have actually really big thrust requirements. This is so many orders of magnitude, they're not, it's not even an issue. The real key issue is the electronics, especially for pulsed stuff. Um, that's a concern for the US because it can be used for, for like weapon systems. Um, so the, the really the biggest issue maybe is the thyristor, um, which I did check, and that does check out. It's not controlled by um, ear. Um, just do, it's, the components are still too low, low performance for them to be restricted as, as to the best of my abilities. Um, so I don't think that any of the individual components or the entire subsystem at this level is controlled on either front. But that is definitely a concern, especially if you're starting to scale up and go into much bigger systems. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you.